Today's lecture covers the September-October LD resolution on single-payer health care. The resolution is resolved the United States ought to implement a single-payer universal health care system. Um, I'm going to start by talking through some of the basic definitions, the terms of the topic, um, and then kind of walk you through the affirmative and negative arguments. Uh, the United States. So the United States is a common term uh, in resolutions that suggest policy action. Uh, most people take it to mean it's the central government in Washington, D.C. in debate. Um, but as you, as you may know, the resolutions normally say the United States federal government, which clearly refers to uh, the central government in Washington, D.C., the executive, uh, the legislative uh, and the judicial branches so the Supreme Court, Congress the president. The term United States um, in this position as an actor can arguably also refer to the states. Uh, there was a college policy topic a number of years ago where they just put in the term United States. Uh, so to try to allow the affirmative to also use state government um, as the actor. So, you know, you could imagine that the 50 states were acting. So, and this obviously has, you know, some implications in terms of kind of how you might uh, respond to the state's counterplan if that's popular in your area. Now, there is a pretty big debate as to whether or not uh, the term United States, when referring to an actor, only refers to the federal government or also refers to the states. Um, and there's a lot of evidence about that. And that evidence is included in a, a separate section. Um, that's available to our subscribers. But I just kind of want to highlight that it kind of generally in debate, we take it to mean the central government in Washington, D.C. But definitely when you take out the, uh, the words federal government, it can refer to the states as well. Ought is basically saying, what should we do? Um, in LD debate, we often take that to mean a moral obligation. Now, obviously, uh, in real life, it can mean more than a moral obligation. Like if I say I ought to go to Walmart, I'm not really arguing that I have a moral obligation to go to Walmart. I'm just saying I maybe ought to go to Walmart to pick up some paper towels. Um, so something to think about. But general and L in generally in LD, uh, we're we're debating about moral issues, especially in, in traditional LD. So. Um, it does kind of have that spin. Are we, so you could think about this and say, is the United States morally obligated to provide a single universal, a single payer universal healthcare system? Now, what is a single payer? A single payer just simply really means that the government pays for all of the care. It doesn't, it's not just paying for, uh, it's paying for everything. So right now the government pays for some care, right? It pays for uh, care through the Veterans Administration for military veterans, pays through care sit for programs such as Medicare for people over 65 and Medicaid for the poor. But um, even then, you know, on Medicare, some people, you know, you're also using private insurance. This basically says the federal government should essentially just become everyone's insurer. And when you go to the doctor, it's the federal government or the governments, as we previously discussed, paying the bill. They are a single payer. Um, this is usually debated uh, in the United States as kind of basically an expansion of Medicare, which I say is a health insurance uh, program for seniors where the government is paying, um, at least in that case, the majority of the cost. But in this case, you know, we're talking about expanding Medicare to cover everybody. And, you know, Bernie Sanders, as you may know, is the big champion of this. It doesn't have to just be Medicare for all. Um, there can be different kind of ways of articulating how a single payer would function, but generally we're talking about a uh, single payer system and generally um, in most uh, contexts, people are discussing Medicare for all or a similar program. Now, universal health care. So universal health care just simply means that everybody gets care. Um, it's not necessarily redundant, though it's similar to single payer, right? A single payer imagines that the government pays for the health care, right? There's just one payer. There aren't like kind of private insurance companies or different levels of government paying for it or kind of any combination of that. But it's just, it, it's about the payer. Universal health care is about the care. Like what care are people rec receiving, right? And the idea of universal care um, 
they're they're not so you know as the first piece of evidence here points out they're not the, they're not really they're not the same thing right they're referring to different things similar things but different things now there's a question that comes up as to what universal healthcare means so you could take it in one sense and say universal healthcare means any kind of any care that you might need it, it can include like you know, preventive care, going to the doctor like, you know, once a year. It could include dental care, it could include mental health care, it could include gender reassignment surgery, it could include literally any type of health care imaginable. And, you know, under the Bernie Sanders plan of paying, you know, of expanding Medicare for all and having a single payer in his version, it, it really covers just about everything. It even covers, uh, you know, undocumented immigrants. It's really, it's health care, really a single payer. For all, um, all, all proposals of a similar nature don't support that. For example, you know, the, there are other proposals in Congress to have a pretty broad definition of, of what universal health care would be provided under a single payer, but maybe wouldn't include immigrants. Um, but you could take it to mean literally everything, but other people to take it to mean just kind of basic health care, right? That you could, you know, get kind of essential like medical services. Um, this, this piece of evidence doesn't define basic, but it, it kind of highlights that point, right? Meaning all residents are covered for basic healthcare services. So you could potentially interpret the resolution to say, we're going to have a single payer for all basic healthcare services. Now, obviously, how you define what universal healthcare is can have a pretty big impact on the debate topic, right? So if you define it super broadly, Right. If it includes dental care, all forms of mental health care, any type of care somebody might need, um, you know, on the pro side, obviously, that opens up a, a lot of, you know, opportunities like for advantages. Right. Um, on the negative side, it would be super expensive. Right. And a lot of the evidence that says that single payer health care systems are would be cheaper, right, which is obviously highly debatable in and of itself because this would be an enormous expenditure. But even those are, aren't really talking about, like, providing, like, every available, like, form of health care that exists. So if we're really debating about every form of health care that exists, it's definitely, like, pretty costly. If we're just talking about providing basic health care services, then maybe it is uh, arguably cheaper. That's a debate, but I'm just saying it, it's something that the affirmative would have a better chance of winning um, if they're just talking about providing basic care. Now, before I got to go into the the affirmative and the, the negative arguments, I want to just talk briefly about the current healthcare system because as a student, uh, it's something you may not understand. As a coach uh, you <laughs> who uh, probably has health insurance or even if you don't, like, you know, as an adult, Right, who kind of uh, you know would need healthcare from time to time, or need to pay for it from time to time, whether for you or for your family, um, you know this is a reality. So the current the current uh, health insurance system in the United States is largely employer based, meaning that when you get a job, um, your employer pays for your health coverage. Um, they don't have to pay for the best healthcare uh, coverage plan in the world. For example, uh, in the city of New York, employers have to pay 50% of the cost of basically the cheapest plan that is available. So your employer doesn't have to provide you with great health care coverage. Um, and some people don't have great health care coverage, but they do need to provide you with health care coverage if your employee employer has at least, I believe it's 15 employees. Um, you can look that up. But if they, any employers of like a certain size have to provide health care insurance um, to their employers, it's a cost for employers. If they're, if they're insuring an individual, it's probably going to cost them around $7,000 a year. Um, if they're paying for health insurance for your entire family, uh, which is also like quite common, that's going to cost them around like $25,000 a year. And of course, the individual on top of that, they'll have to pay a, 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 what they, you call a, a copay. It's usually a small amount, like if you go to the doctor or hospital, and then up to a, a certain amount a year in, in total healthcare expenditures. That's called a deductible. So, you know, if my insurance is a $2,500 annual deductible, um, I may spend that. Once I spend that $2,500 through co-pays and other types of small fees, I might have to pay. Then I don't have to pay anymore. Um, but I can be on the hook for as much as that myself personally. And I actually have uh, very good health insurance. Now, 
Obamacare, uh, you may hear about, is for people who don't receive it through their employers, um, but they can purchase insurance, right? They can purchase the same insurance uh, or similar insurance. Uh, you know, there's a number of insurance providers that are available under Obamacare. And if they don't make as much money, then they can access that care at a subsidized rate. So it's still people paying for care. The quality of the the plans vary. You have your bronze. I think they're bronze, silver, and gold plans. But you can receive some health insurance through Obamacare. If you don't get any health insurance at work, you just have to pay uh, a portion of the uh, what you call the premium. Now, some people uh, kind of receive insurance or have their bills to pay through Medicaid, which is a program for the poor, uh, which you can uh, qualify for, um, especially if you uh, live in certain states, not all states. All states have not agreed to expand Medicaid, which is also part of Obamacare. Um, and then there's Medicare, which is an insurance program for, for the elderly, which is subsidized for the government, which pays a substantial portion of health insurance costs. Though uh, the elderly, those over age 65, still have to pay a portion of the cost as well. Um, some veterans, uh, you know, people who are in the military, they can receive care. I believe it's around 18 million through the Veterans Administration's hospitals. Um, but there are approximately 30 million people in the United States who lack health insurance. Uh, that's almost uh, 10% of our population. Uh, and that covers everyone from, you know, little kids uh, till the elderly. And these, those are, that's the number of people who just lack like health insurance at all, right? That's not talking about people who maybe just don't have great health insurance, right? So you, you also hear this term underinsured, which means their insurance isn't very great or they have maybe just like catastrophic health insurance and they have to pay like the difference in, um, you know, they, they could say maybe they, they have catastrophic health care that covers health care costs that are over $10,000, but they don't have to pay for, uh, uh, they don't have, you know, above that, they don't have to pay, but obviously $10,000 is still a lot of money. Now, when we look at this, uh, you know, in terms of the resolution, there, there's some different questions, right? In LD debate, we're always debating about kind of, well, we're often debating about moral issues. That's how we, how LD started. Um, but obviously, it's not just about moral issues, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but <clears throat> this piece of evidence I just happened to find uh, when reading about healthcare says so kind of like there are three elements of a moral point of view, right? What kind of judgments, a moral, a moral judgment are we making about people or systems, right? Second, can we generalize that moral, that, that judgment? beyond a person, right? So not just saying, well, gee, I should get health care, right? But if I can, the reasons that I, I'm coming up with that I should have health care, those are generalizable to other people um, and arguably generalizable to other people, then that is a moral question. Um, and then, you know, how it affects other people, not not just ourselves. Um, but that just kind of interesting since it's LD I want to introduce. Now, this is kind of essentially... Um, there are some different elements to this topic, right? So there, there are moral issues, and we'll get into that in a minute. But there are also policy questions. And it's kind of hard to escape, even if you're kind of a hardcore, like, LD is about philosophy kind of person. It's, it's hard to escape the reality that this is a, that this topic is a policy question, right? It's, it's actually asking if the United States federal government should implement this say a policy, right? A, a radical, it's a pretty radical policy. Um, and I'll talk about why it's radical when I talk about the economy, but it basically would completely change how the healthcare system in the United States works, right? Um, but it's, it's not just radical, like some utopian thing. It's also something that people um, practically discuss. So when we're kind of talking about policy questions, right? There's a question of, gee, will, the, will this save people's lives? Um, which it probably would on the net, but it, it it's debatable, right? There's a strong debate as to what impact this would have on healthcare. How would it how would it impact the economy as a whole? This is a major a major portion, a major sector of our economy. Um, and you know, then you know, especially in debater terms, like what are kind of some externally related policy consequences? Would this strengthen or hurt U.S. global leadership? How would it impact our military in terms of maybe people being healthier? 
you know, if this passed now, a popular argument will be would it, you know, protect the Democrats in the Senate, their ability to retain the, the Senate in the midterm elections? Would it make it more likely that they, or at least get them a better shot of like keeping the House? What would it mean for Biden's political power, what we call his political capital uh, in debate? We'll talk about those arguments later, but there are some policy questions. So let's kind of start with kind of the argument, the policy question of whether or not it saves lives. And then from there, we'll move into the moral questions. But the moral question, in a way, kind of the policy, the saves lives policy question kind of like undergrids it, like to a degree, right? Like we're going to ultimately, our arguments about morality are mostly <laughs> assumed that like at least it would benefit people, right? So question number one is like, does it benefit people? Then question number two, if it does, like kind of is there a moral obligation to do so. So I don't really see any way of kind of escaping uh, this moral question. But you have kind of the number, as I said, there's around, you know, 30 some million uninsured people in the United States. And then, of course, you have you have some people who are, you know, what we said described earlier is underinsured. Now, obviously, all those people aren't dying due to lack of health insurance. Um, there is a good piece of evidence that says now, the number of deaths attributable to that are around 68,000. Now, that's obviously substantially less than 36 million. Okay, but, okay, you can at least attribute that. Um, other, there are some recent studies that say a lot of people died in COVID due to lack of health insurance. You know, that that's normally, that's higher than that normal figure of around uh, 68,000. I've seen research and there's evidence in the files that puts it at anywhere from 125,000 to 300,000. Um, some people just dying, you know, because they retreat, you know, receive poor treatment. But there's kind of this general idea that people are dying because they don't have adequate health care and you can't quantify and articulate uh, some of the impact to that. Now, you could also talk about kind of areas where we could, where more health care is needed, such as in mental health care. Healthcare for people with disabilities. You could talk about reproductive health, um, you know, potentially abortion. So those are kind of areas where I think you could claim advantages, uh, especially if you kind of have a broad definition of universal healthcare and what single payer is going to pay for. Uh, then you have other groups such as Native Americans. You could talk about why their healthcare is poor. Um, undocumented, you know, people in the United States, uh, arguably illegally. Right. But, you know, maybe uh, be good if they had strong health care, um, health care as well. There was just an article in the New York Post uh, I read this morning uh, by happenstance that talked about how, you know, there was a woman who kind of came as a, like, you know, she's going to claim she kind of was a refugee living in poverty, uh, came through, uh, went into Texas. Texas shipped her to New York, but uh, she's pregnant. Right. So she's worried about like what. Uh, health care is going to be kind of available uh, for her as she kind of she goes through childbirth and as her child is young. Um, you can also talk about people living in rural areas. There's a big problem with the financing, the affordability of health care uh, in rural areas and rural health in general. We could talk about opioids or people being addicted to uh, painkillers. So there's some specific uh, t like kind of topics within the topic that you could arguably claim um, an advantage from. In terms of moral claims, there are a number of different uh, philosophies or philosophical perspectives that inform the question of whether or not uh, providing health care is a moral obligation. Uh, a lot has been written on this, and in this section, I'll talk through some of the main ideas. And I did conveniently find a list in one of the books I was reading uh, that kind of highlights that, and I'll use that to kind of start the discussion. Uh, the first I'll kind of start is, you know, summarized in the first couple sentences there is, is John Locke's social contract theory, um, which you're probably familiar with as a, as an LD debater. Uh, this basic idea is that, uh, people, uh, kind of informing a society kind of implicitly agree to a social contract where the government provides kind of certain services, whether they be protections or affirmative services such as healthcare and citizens have certain obligations. Um, you know, you can contextualize that in terms of healthcare and say, hey, the government has an obligation um, to take care of its citizens. Now, 
there is a there are a lot of you know also you know in terms of um, you know John Rawls there's a there's a lot of kind of philosophies um, that kind of flow from that right um, you know and different ideas that John Rawls had the one one of them is the idea of the original position the original position says that since you don't know uh, where in society you're going to be born. Uh, so imagine you're, you know, you're in the womb, you know, you're in the womb, you know, you're going to come out, you know, that society is basically kind of exists as it does, but you don't know where in society you'll fall. So you don't know if you'll, uh, when you come out of the womb, you'll be born to parents, maybe of, of more limited means or more extensive means. And obviously that's going to impact you as a child. So the idea is that you would probably choose a society if you had a choice that more kind of fairly or equally distributes resources because you may need access to those resources. Um, so that's kind of you in the original position. This is articulated in other ways um, as a birth lottery argument. Uh, you don't know where in society you're going to be born. It's basically a lottery. It's totally random, like where you end up being born. Uh, and as a result of that, like what happened, you know, you would you would kind of choose a society that more equally distributes its resources. A second philosophy is utilitarianism, um, which kind of generally speaking means the greatest good for the greatest number. This is probably going to be more used on the con to argue that, uh, you know, a single payer would have some disastrous effect on society and negatively impact a lot of people and should be rejected. But obviously, if you can prove it beneficial to society on the whole, then you might want to use this on the affirmative. The book also lists libertarian ethics. Um, which in context of the affirmative means that providing health care provides people with more meaningful choices in their lives. It's probably going to be a more common negative argument that says you should never take, like, for example, my $20 and give it to somebody uh, who needs it uh, for their health care. Maybe I individually have that moral obligation to do that. Maybe I ought to make that choice. But the government shouldn't take the $20 from me uh, and give it to somebody else. Um, there'll be a lot of kind of affirmative arguments that kind of fit in the next categories, I guess, of, of moral claims or philosophical arguments. The one is uh, a communitarian ethics that we should do. Uh, people should try to strengthen and protect their own communities and societies and do things for the common good. And obviously providing health care for everyone might strengthen the common good. There's an argument about kind of equal share and equal opportunity, right? Equality within health care. Um, which is obviously going to be part of that. There is a, uh, to go back to Rawls, there is kind of an argument that uh, based on a difference principle and principles of fairness, that what you should do in a society is say, okay, who uh, the least disadvantaged members, those are the people that we should help first. There are arguments about human dignity and making a contribution to the, to the common good. Um, there's freedom and equality, right? Like, uh, you know, freedom for healthcare, making choices, um, equality kind of similar to what we talked about before. There's arguments from uh, liberation ethics, sometimes articulated as liberation theology, that we should help the poor and the oppressed. Um, so those are those are some different foundations. There's there are others. Uh, there's the idea of right. Healthcare is a right. Now, generally, when you're talking about healthcare as a right, you're talking about a positive right. So a positive right is to say you have a right to something, whether it be health care or like an education. In the United States, um, we generally think in terms of negative rights. Right? So, for example, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, they're kind of they're focused on protecting negative rights. So like First Amendment, you have free speech. The government can't take that away. The Second Amendment, you can buy a gun. The government can't take that away, right? But it's not an affirmative, right? They're not saying like the government should give you a gun, right? Or the government like should train you to be like a free speech advocate, right? So healthcare, the idea of healthcare is uh, kind of a different form of a right than something that we're usually familiar with and talking about. It's a positive right and you can have entire debates about like positive versus negative rights. Now, some people can say that there's a little bit of a, there are arguably a negative right here is at stake that we, you know, when people are exposed to like pollution, they can be like unhealthy. So the government should like protect you from that pollution. Uh, that's probably a little bit of a stretch, but you can see that there's kind of a spin on negative rights. 
Um, there's questions of kind of fairness in general. Like, so for example, right now, our government invests in medical research. So if that's true, if everybody's tax dollars are being invested in medical research, then maybe everybody should benefit from that. Um, uh, you can get the idea that people should be able to maximize their own capabilities. Uh, there's an author, Nussbaum, who writes about that, which also kind of gets back at the, at the previous slide about some of those kind of societal abilities that we're developing. But you could look at an individual level and say an individual should be able to develop their own capabilities. Um, then you can say that healthcare, some people think that healthcare is a natural right, just something that people have as kind of part of being born, as part of nature, because um, you should you should be healthy. It's a natural need to want to be healthy. Uh, there's kind of general moral obligations about obligations to aid others, to in, in, to help strangers, uh, which could become a part of a, a case about like how uh, immigrants um, should be provided with health care. Um, and then there's kind of general claims about how it's the government that has should be the one, right, distributing the health care. It's not just about like this resolution is not just about a right to health care and individuals more obligation to provide health care. But it's talking about the government providing care. So you want there, there there should be some arguments or could be some arguments about how the health care, right, should not just be left to the market, to the free market to decide to business to decide how health care gets distributed, because that just kind of impacts uh, whether or not we uh, live or die. Um, to unpack a few of these arguments um, in a little bit more detail, let's look at equality, right? That first of all, we should have social, socioeconomic equality, right, between people. Everyone is not equal in intelligence or beauty, but we should be equal in health. And uh, the government can help make that possible. I talked about Rawls's difference principle that the least advantaged should have their needs met first, which is an argument for the government making uh, it possible. There's an argument for equality of opportunity, right? That without health care, if you're unhealthy, you don't really have the chance to develop and have this kind of equality of opportunity, which a lot of people believe in, right? I mean, certainly like in some sense, like, you know, some people kind of have this like aversion to socialism, right? But every, almost everybody believes, right, in public education because public education like provides this opportunity. Well, if you have a public, if you, if you have a free education, but you're unhealthy, uh, you don't really have much opportunity. So um, there's an argument about that. Then they're kind of, like I say, some of these claims are about equality or general. There's a lot written about racial equality, uh, and how minorities, especially blacks and Hispanics, um, do not have access to appropriate health care. Um, and there's also some, you know, written about women, particularly in the context of, of reproductive health as well. So there's a lot of different arguments that can be made about equality. Uh, there's concepts of justice, right? Um, that You know, justice is kind of a common go to argument. An LD debate, right? Uh, it's important, arguably. It's, it's something that all uh, societies strive for. It's kind of in the Constitution, right? And there's different types of justice, right? There's retributive justice. Okay. Oh, if you, if you do something bad, you should be punished. There's reconciliatory justice. Um, you know, let's try to kind of come to a resolution of our conflict. There's procedural justice. Am I being treated fairly in the process of like being punished or determined if I'm guilty? Right. And what we're really talking about is distributive justice, like how are resources distributed in society? And equality can obviously be important to that equal distribution. Um, but all, there's also kind of arguments about how justice requires not harming others and a system of health care that kind of results in denial of care where only people with money can, aff can afford it is arguably uh, arguably results in a denial of justice. We talked about Rawls's original position earlier. We talked about the difference principle. Um, I think there's a lot of uh, interesting arguments here, right? And also the capabilities argument and what it means to live the good life, right? And why that's important to justice. Um, and I think this can be useful because you could argue essentially that justice is more important than liberty, right? Because liberty, liberty and equality to a degree compete, right? If everybody's just free to do whatever they want, there's a lot of liberty there, but then people aren't necessarily going to be 
treated equally, whether it's based on their own kind of natural talents and capabilities, right? Some people are going to end up with an awful lot more, which isn't inherently bad as, as long as everybody kind of gets at least a minimum of what they need. But that's not really going to happen if we leave the market to distribute um, health care, right? Um, so so the argument is, is that liberty, liberty and equality kind of compete with one another, right? As concepts. So I think we would all, all agree they're both valid. Like we all want liberty. We all want justice. I mean, we all, we all want equality, right? To a degree, at least, right? Even though there's a debate as to how much equality the government should be providing. So you have liberty and equality competing and, and then justice kind of comes in and it balances that to a degree, right? So justice is, is kind of trying to protect uh, equality in society, but also make sure that things kind of like aren't just, you know, completely like kind of unfair, kind of balances it out. So if you can win that kind of single payer uh, protects justice and that justice balances the two, you can do a lot of, to counteract, like, like I said, the common negative like libertarianism argument about how uh, the government kind of shouldn't be involved in like kind of people's uh, people's like economic lives. They shouldn't be taking too many of their 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 resources through taxation and forcibly redistributing it through others in all instances. But this is an instance you can say when the government should do it, it best protects justice and justice uh, kind of balances out like these liberty um, versus equality tension in the best way possible. You could also kind of talk about rights, right? I talked about the difference between uh, positive and negative rights and that, uh, you know, maybe the government should be protecting positive rights. You could slide in an argument about negative rights, uh, even though it's not great. You could kind of see what your opponent does with it. Um, talk about protecting the dignity of persons. You could say it's an important part of the Constitution. That's probably a little bit of a stretch. Uh, the people, But you can say people should be the Constitution says people should be treated equally and not deprived of their rights. So maybe you can draw some constitutional foundation from there. You can talk about international human rights. Um, human rights are, are really kind of, I mean, there's different foundations of them, right? It's a debate in and of itself, whether human rights are kind of derived from kind of a, a God or like kind of a religious, uh, whatever religious authority you have, or whether they're just natural as part of being born or whether they're just the rights um, that we get, like kind of once governments decide through treaties and other international agreements that we have these rights, um, some of which the United States has signed on to and that health care is such a right and like should be protected. So you could take a um, rights angle on it. Beneficence just refers to the idea that we should basically just kind of benefit people and look out, which comes as manifested in other ways in, in some of the discussions we had. And then non malfeasance argues we should never harm a person and that depriving uh, individuals of, of health care uh, can actually harm uh, other people. Uh, utilitarianism, um, you know, I think this is good to kind of discuss at the end. As I said, it's just the greatest good for the greatest number. Um, so, on the affirmative, you might want to say, okay, well, this protects society as a whole. It's the greatest good for the greatest number. I mean, look, if you can win that argument, you're probably going to win the debate regardless. The only thing the negative could probably really go for it, you know, the negative approaches uh, to preview a little bit are either going to be probably utilitarianism, right? Um, we should focus on the greatest good for the greatest number and single payer healthcare systems are bad. Or they're going to focus and say, you should never take money away from individual people. Um, and, uh, you know, that's bad. It's kind of like an, like an individual based moral claim. Um, and then, you know, you could on the affirmative use utilitarianism to challenge that if that's the way, uh, the debate is going to go down. And then on the affirmative, so you could say this protects society as a whole. Or you could attack utilitarianism, right? If you're trying to make a general claim about a societal benefit and the negative is focused more on this individual rights argument, um, that utilitarianism is a bad approach. It doesn't protect the minorities. It ignores rights. It justifies racism, et cetera. Um, you know, you probably, you know, that's like a debate unto itself. Now, of course, there's other ways that, uh, you know, the negative arguments could go. There's different critiques people can make and we'll talk about those later. But in terms of kind of what you might consider the the core, the traditional arguments about 
um, healthcare. That's where some of these are going to, uh, that some of the theories that we just discussed are where the major arguments are going to derive from. We'll talk about some of the critiques uh, later in the lecture. Now, also kind of moving into this now, so we talked about kind of uh, saving lives. We've talked about the, the philosophical arguments. And in this third section, I want to talk about the economy because changing the healthcare system in such a dramatic way would have a significant effect on the economy. And of course, you can debate whether it's good or bad, but I want to highlight here how significant of an effect that is. Healthcare is around... Uh, 20% of our economy, our total economy, all economic activity that occurs in the United States occurs in the healthcare sector. Um, basically, it's around $4 trillion of a $20 trillion economy. So you're, you're really in, you know, there's obviously some government involvement and payment in the healthcare system now, but you're talking about a radical restructuring of how healthcare is paid for. Um, and of course, that's going to impact kind of the other, you know, all, all, all $4 trillion isn't about how it's paid for. That's obviously includes how it's consumed, like in doctor's offices and, you know, by pharmaceutical companies, healthcare innovation, et cetera. But that would all be impacted by a single payer system. So it's kind of want to highlight that big changes in healthcare um, are going to have a large impact on the economy. So on the affirmative side, of course, we're going to be looking at how does the current system uh, hurt the economy, and then, of course, how might a single payer help it? So basically, a, a kind of a core underneath this is that medical costs are rising really high in the United States. They're, they're, they're always on an upward trajectory. But even when you account for inflation, you see a substantial increase in medical costs. Um, you know, this can be driven by a number of things, including insurance, administration, administrative costs, um, people looking for kind of profits, right? Whether they're kind of drug companies, hospitals, or doctors, or people are just looking for like pay increases, right? Or there can be costs associated with liability, right? Like, you know, doctor performs a bad surgery, gets sued for millions of dollars, right? So insurance is super expensive. Then you just kind of have the normal, uh, in this, in this current time, exceptional inflation in the economy, but Costs for healthcare are generally rising substantially higher, uh, or at a substantially faster rate than even in inflate, than even inflation is. So how does this kind of arguably hurt the economy? Well, as I said, it, you know, employers, right, are paying for insurance now for the most part. So as those costs increase, that's more and more money that, that businesses have to pay, right? And if businesses have to spend all this money on their employees' healthcare insurance, then that's less money they have to invest um, in new products, new developments, new innovations. It's more that they have to charge for their goods and services, which makes it difficult to compete with goods and services that are provided from other countries. When it, the costs increase for the consumers, right? If you don't have insurance or you have a, a high copay or you're paying part of your insurance like monthly premium that your employer is paying, uh, then you have less money to spend on other things, right? And in some cases, if your medical costs get super high and you don't have adequate insurance or you don't have insurance at all, you could be forced into personal bankruptcy, right? And, you know, if you have less money for other things, that impacts economic activity in that sector. You can also have state and local governments being affected by this because state governments, of course, and local governments, even they're paying their cost, you know, their costs to their employees, health insurance, right? So that's impacting them negatively. There are some insurance, you know, some insurance that does exist for the poor that's paid for by the state and the federal government. So that's triggering like tax increases, right? There's all kind of ways that this is hurting uh, state and local governments, right? Which is actually a great, a kind of a strategic advantage to use against a team if counter plans are popular in their area and they, they read the state's counter plan, uh, then, well, you know, you can say, well, OK, this is the state's counter plan would increase spending more and even link more into our advantage. But how? Right. But that is that this is kind of some of the ways that basically the current system functions to hurt the economy. So how would a single payer help the economy? Now, in some ways, it's just kind of the opposite. Right. So we're going to put more money into consumers pockets because they're not paying 
all those co-pays that I talked about earlier, they're not paying into, you know, usually a worker. In over like 93% of instances, workers are paying part of that health insurance premium um, that, you know, the health care that the employers are providing, workers are paying for some part of that, right? So it's going to put more money back into their pockets. It's going to put more money into business pockets in terms of that they can use maybe to pay their employees more if they're nice or just for investments. We're overall going to have a healthier population, which means that more people are going to be working and working regularly. You have kind of a solution to job lock. Um, so job lock is the idea that people just stay in their current jobs because that's where they get their health insurance. And if they didn't have to get their health insurance in their current job, they'd be more willing to maybe take a risk someplace else or just like start their own business and innovate. Uh, there's an argument that preventive care is cheaper than emergency care. The argument is that if you have preventive care and you see the doctor regularly, the doctor can prevent an illness from developing. Whereas if you just kind of wait and you get like super sick and you go to the emergency room, um, then that becomes a lot more uh, cost effective. Uh, single payer systems are, would probably also include price controls or the government negotiating with farm, with uh, pharmaceutical companies to buy drugs and just other medical suppliers, and since the government would be paying for everything, they would have a lot of leverage in the negotiation, right? Um, uh, you know, companies, like we say, would have more money uh, for innovation and uh, reduce or uh, improve their competitiveness because they could sell their products at cheaper prices. And importantly, arguably, this could save the government money. If there's a way you could get healthcare costs under control, as I said, the government does pay for some health care now, like a good chunk of it. And that health care could become cheaper to the government. So, you know, there's a lot of there's are, you know, people really talk about how expensive single payer would be. And we'll talk about that later. It would be quite expensive. But there are some reasonable arguments as to how a single payer system would actually kind of benefit the economy. Now. What are some other ways that other advantages that people might read? I think, you know, these the, the, the one areas we just discussed, saving lives, right, is kind of like a core debate. You have the philosophical arguments, which, you know, is kind of a debate in society at more of a thin level, but obviously a big part of Lincoln Douglas debate. And then you have the economy arguments, which I think at the very least are strategic for the affirmative because the negative is going to raise like economic objections. But what are some other kind of arguments? Well, there's arguments about disease, stopping the spread of diseases. You know, there's all kind of literature now about how we're going to have more and more diseases like COVID because with the climate changing, new parts of the environment like are being exposed to humans. There are diseases in these animal populations that are going to spread to humans. Um, and of course, if there's single payer health care, then there's kind of more resources in the healthcare system generally. There's stronger surveillance, there's stronger coordination and information sharing amongst kind of government agencies that maybe stop disease or stop a bioterror attack. Uh, there's arguments about military readiness um, in terms of, first of all, getting healthcare costs down for the military, right? Because the military is paying the healthcare costs of, of its soldiers and like often the soldiers' families, right? And then you have the costs of, you know, like the VA, but also just improving the health of the population could strengthen the military. Um, and, you know, like I said, they might make some arguments about state spending um, and trying to kind of get the cost of health care generally under, generally under control. So whether you kind of see those as, I, I kind of put those in a third category of the benefits. Um, so that actually makes a fourth, right? So you, because you have the safe lives, you have the philosophical arguments, you have the economy, then I might just put these under kind of some um, some additional some additional benefits that like could be accrued as a result of like providing health care for everybody. In the next section of this uh, lecture, I want to talk about how to answer some of the common uh, negative arguments. There are certainly more negative arguments, but I just want to address uh, how to respond to the common. So, of course, a common argument is that this is very uh, expensive um, and this is going to increase the total amount of government debt. Uh, but first of all, as I mentioned, the current high costs of care are driving up uh, government expenditures quite substantially because the government does fund a substantial amount of health care. 
uh, and that these current costs are kind of resulting in tax increases and things that the negative uh, will say is bad. Also, kind of our annual deficit. Um, deficit is the amount of, you know, the, the negative difference between the total amount of revenues and expenditures in a given year and our total debt uh, is increasing uh, every year, making it largely, uh, largely kind of non-unique. Um, we talk about how we just talked briefly about how it's going to strengthen the economy in other ways, which you could argue are more important that those have, if you win, that those, those economic arguments are true and the economy is strengthened. You can then say, look, the debt, the total debt we have, the annual deficit doesn't really have a negative impact on the economy, or at least not a very significant negative impact compared to the overall, uh, economic, uh, benefits that we're talking about and, there's a whole kind of uh, there's a whole theory. It's called modern monetary theory that argues that deficits in, in the total debt don't really matter to the economy, um, don't really matter to the economy at all uh, in, in a negative way, and can even have a positive benefit. And I've included some evidence um, on that in uh, in the release. Answering the pharma argument. First of all, briefly, what does the pharma argument say? The pharma argument says that uh, as part of single payer systems, uh, the government will negotiate, uh, as I suggested, uh, in, a, in a very strong way uh, with the pharmaceutical companies, maybe even setting some price caps. Um, they, the government recently did this as part of the new uh, uh, well, Inflation Reduction Act that was passed by the government, but it only applies to Medicare. Uh, that the government will kind of more aggressively negotiate um, and maybe even use some price caps in negotiating with pharmaceutical companies uh, in regard to purchasing drugs. The negative argument says that if you have this single payer, the government becomes the single payer nationwide, then what will happen is that the government will uh, you know, negotiate really low prices for these drugs and it'll hurt the pharmaceutical industry uh, resulting in kind of less uh, in fewer resources for them uh, to invest in innovation. Now, how do we answer this argument? There's some good evidence that says that they don't really innovate that much, that most of the money uh, just goes kind of for lifestyle drugs um, uh, to solve kind of lifestyle problems to improve our, our, our lifestyle, not for uh, big medical needs. Uh, that pharma innovations also often depend on the government. Look, the, the, the pharma industry did uh, just give us a, you know, I think uh, what most people, I know it's a little controversial, right? Consider to be a great vaccine to stop the spread of the, at least the, the significant health effects, I should say, of, of the coronavirus. But this was uh, kind of resulted from billions of dollars, right? Uh, being invested by the United States federal government uh, into this drug. Um, there obviously still be a lot of um, money that, that going into purchases, maybe even more, maybe more drugs would be purchased because now everybody's getting health care, a lot of, you know, that they couldn't otherwise previously afford. Um, and companies, of course, still have the incentives to innovate and come up with new drugs to sell, uh, uh, you know, to sell to consumers in this case that would be paid for by the government. Um, that even even with kind of some revenue reductions, there still be enough money available for research and that, you know, other countries, they have industries, um, you know, the UK, other countries, Germany um, that provide more, you know, China that provide uh, either free or heavily subsidized uh, health care for individuals still have still have strong um, pharmaceutical industries. But I imagine this will be a popular um a popular negative argument, especially since it was on the last September, October uh, topic last year um, about intellectual property rights. This was uh, for drugs. This was a primary negative argument. So I'm sure people will, you know, add the new link cards and update their files and uh, use this argument again on the negative. So definitely be prepared to debate it. As I said, libertarianism is kind of the core the core negative objection to the to the argument, the idea that, you know, maybe maybe we should provide charity. Maybe I should decide to provide, take some of my money and spend it on charity, but just that I should not be obligated to do so. Right. Like the government, not I should not be obligated to do so. And the government shouldn't take money. Right. That I've earned, which is essentially my property. Take it away and give it to somebody else. 
Um, and I think that, you know, this is like kind of the core philosophical position against this, right? Like it's, it's kind of the extreme opposite of socialism, right? Some people say single payer is socialism. I mean, <laughs> it has a socialist element. I mean, sure. Uh, so does social security, right? Um, so does a lot of things that the government does. So this is, it's, it's not really going to lead to the creation of a socialist government, but, uh, but my point here more is that the extreme opposite of that is, is kind of a, an extreme libertarianism where people should just be argued that where it's argued that people should just be able to make their own choices uh, and do their own things with their own money. Now, the argument here is that the market, how to respond to this? Well, first of all, at least especially in terms of healthcare, this is kind of a failure, right? Like we, we have a system where 30 million people are, are uninsured, right? Where you have tens of millions of more that are underinsured. You have 68,000 people generally dying per year due to lack of health care and a uh, lack of health insurance, I should say, and, you know, maybe a couple hundred thousand more in the pandemic. Um, second of all, you can say that healthy people will benefit society, right? Just as security does. What do I mean by just as security does? Well, libertarians argue that one, one legitimate purpose of the government is to provide security of its citizens, right? Whether it's through the military or the police. Well, what's the point of that, right? Well, to to make sure that you live, right? To you have your opportunity to live out whatever your natural life is. Well, okay, so does healthcare, right? Healthcare provides that opportunity as well. Um, you could say that, you know, a general criticism of the theory is, you know, the idea here is that, oh, well, people work really hard, you know, they get their money. Okay, but talent also kind of has a big impact on that, right? Like how smart you are, you know, how social you are, maybe kind of what opportunities incidentally arise through like social connections um, and just, you know, stuff that you really kind of beyond your control maybe has a bigger impact on your economic situation than you realize. Um, you can say that, you know, as you talked about earlier, the government already invests money into medical advances. So those should be distributed equally um, in a free market. You, you know, uh, you, you, you're kind of choosing your provider, but maybe you could in a single payer as well, right? You're still, you, you probably are. You're still choosing, you're still choosing your doctor, right? You could still choose the hospital that you go to. This is just the government paying for it. So you still have a lot of choice in this system. And that basically, you know, we talked earlier about healthcare being a right. It's not just simply a commodity, right? It's not like I'm, you know, I'm giving this lecture, uh, recording it off a laptop. A laptop is a commodity. The table the laptop is sitting on is a commodity. My car is a commodity. Healthcare, we shouldn't just think of another as another commodity that's available for purchase, right? That it, it's something that that we, that is important to who we, who we are and our human survival. All right. And the second part of this lecture, I want to talk about are the negative arguments. Now, on the on the affirmative side, I kind of talked about like some major arguments, and then went through and like how to answer the the negative arguments. In this section, I'm kind of kind of start in reverse. I'm going to talk about how to answer the core affirmative arguments. I'll conclude with some, you know, what we kind of call like our, our kind of off case arguments and weave in kind of the philosophical approaches that the negative may want to select. Two of which I've, I've kind of arguably already discussed the utilitarianism and the libertarianism approaches. Now, of course, as I say, I think a lot of people will make a basic saves lives argument because it really, you know, it under undergrids, you know, as I said, their philosophical arguments, their economy arguments, etc. Uh, so how are you going to answer this argument? I think there are a number of different answers you can make. The first is that, um, you know, if they, you know, this really high number, the 32 million uh, number uh, isn't, the, you know, those are the people, that's the number of people who don't have access to health care. That's not the number of people who die from uh, access to health care. Obviously, there, there is a 68,000 number that is substantially lower and a, a bit debatable in and of itself. But you certainly can at the very least get the number down to 68,000 uh, relative to 32 million. And of course, the, the, the pandemic numbers uh, do not remain as high. Um, and then there's, you know, medical, you know, and just accessing medical care itself does not necessarily save lives. I mean, obviously people still die, uh, even when they have access to care. Some people get sick from going into the hospital itself because they're exposed, uh, to z diseases, right? And because sometimes the, the treatments they receive are actually bad for them. This is called iatrogenesis. 
Um, if we increase demand on the healthcare system, this can mean longer wait times for people uh, who are seeking care. Um, since there's only a, kind of a basically a finite amount of care, more care can kind of be developed in the healthcare system itself. But there's only a finite amount of care that maybe so that care is going to have to be rationed amongst people. I know other ways that it is probably meaning that there is arguably not a net increase in care. Um, if the government tries to control the cost when it becomes a single payer by paying doctors less or reimbursing hospitals for less, then some doctors may quit, exacerbating the crisis. Um, there's good evidence that says the quality of care under Medicare is not really that high. And that if the quality of care decreases, then more people may go abroad to seek care, um, which may be not be the best care. Um, and there's actually good evidence, and this is a good comparative claim that the, the negative can make, that when the quality of care goes down, uh, not only do like kind of people die and don't receive appropriate care, but the number of people who, who die from lower quality care actually exceeds the number of people who die from like a lack of care. So if you have lower quality care because doctors are quitting, because resources are stretched thin, because there's longer wait times, because the care that like the care that we have now gets rationed amongst more people, then there's lower quality care. You could have a net increase in death. Of course, we also talked about how lower prices could hurt the pharmaceutical industry and hurt innovation and just kind of hurt innovation in general if there's fewer resources flowing into the healthcare system because the government is trying to cut costs. And if the con wins that the economy gets worse as a result of this, uh, you know, uh, single payer system that a bad economy can hurt health, it causes poor nutrition, people have less money for quality food, it causes stress, etc. Um, and some people argue that it creates a moral hazard. I don't think this is a great argument, so I put it last. But some people say, gee, if people have access to health care, then they won't really care. Um, they won't really care about their health. As discussed, there are a number of uh, general approaches that you can take towards answering the morality argument, and particularly uh, the healthcare morality argument. The first, as you probably have argued in many of your debates, uh, you can defend the philosophy of utilitarianism. Uh, there's obviously a lot of nuances to this, um, but the basic idea is that we should, the most ethical choice is a choice that protects the greatest number of people especially for policymakers or governmental actions that re governmental actors that really aren't making decisions about their own individual morality but are trying to make choices for society they should focus on the greatest good for the greatest number now of course that does mean that the you know the negative will need to win that on balance providing a, a single payer healthcare system is on balance undesirable because it hurts the economy or causes some other kind of problem and that outweighs the benefits. But once the negative wins that, then they could kind of override any affirmative value claims by simply focusing on the greatest good for the greatest number. Um, in terms of healthcare in particular, you can point out that re really I defend the idea of healthcare as a good, as a product or a collection of goods. Um, I said earlier, you know, that, oh, well, gee, my computer is, is, is like a product, right? This table is a product. Um, but healthcare really is, is a product, right? It depends on a, a doctor and or a nurse, like to provide the service. It is something that we pay for. Technologies have been developed by, um, industry and we probably wouldn't have those technologies, uh, without industry. And it's something that is in finite supply, just like any good. It's not like an idea, you know, whether or not we should accept a particular idea. Um, if you don't have to consider the supply, that kind of changes. The calculation, but if you kind of define it as a is a good and kind of win that it is a good or a collection of goods, can help you undermine any strong moral claim. You could also point out that spending on healthcare might trade off with other social goods, such as like education spending or other types of welfare. And that look, everybody might not want this, right? Like everybody might not want to spend so much money on healthcare. It may not be as important to them. Um, you can argue that counter plans, or we'll talk about counter plans, if counter plans are accepted in your area, different actions that can be taken uh, to fulfill kind of the, the responsibility. And of course, as I mentioned many times in the lecture, you kind of defend libertarianism, right? The idea that each person, whatever they earn, really belongs to them and the government shouldn't be allowed to come and forcibly uh, take it away from you. 
in terms of answering racism, uh, racism is a strong argument. Minorities, especially blacks and Hispanics, are disproportionately affected and impacted by the lack of access. But you could argue that giving them um, access to a medical system that's itself racist uh, is not really going to do a lot to solve racism. And of course, you can argue that, you know, the popular Afro-pessimism critique that social society itself is racist. There is a kind of Afro-pessimist critiques of providing health care. And there are links to those uh, arguments in the in the file, re- in the in the release and the evidence. In terms of addressing cost containment, you can argue that Medicare is bad at cost containment. That, of course, if we have unnecessary doctor visits because you can just go get free health care whenever you want, that that's going to drive up prices that people are going to get prescribed prescriptions that can't really necessarily, um, they wouldn't have been prescribed before just because they're so expensive, but now there are no limits. And that this is going to result in a net increase in federal spending, U.S. government spending, even if there's some control, um, you know, if there's some net control of healthcare costs, which I think, I think pro teams, affirmative teams are going to be, or debaters are going to be able to win that, you know, when the government's involved in negotiating the prices for the services, uh, when there are fewer administrative costs, which is a big affirmative argument, uh, because there isn't so much billing and all like these kind of requirements involved, that their costs are going to go down. But when you sp- when you have so many more people having access to health care, that that's going to raise the price. And don't forget our earlier discussion of what universal health care means. If it's really universal health care that's provided, and this health care is provided to everyone, um, then uh, the costs are going to increase, right? So now it's like, you know, you can access any type of mental health care, all dental care, any conceivable medical service or prescription, then the costs there are going to rise. How could this hurt the economy? Well, as mentioned, right, there's going to be, there could be, an, uh, like, in terms of how this is going to be paid for, it's only going to be paid for in, like, you know, the federal government's going to pay for it in a certain number of ways. First of all, they could increase the debt, Right. That would that would probably be uh, that would probably increase to a degree. We would probably right deficit spend some of the money with maybe long term projected cost savings. That's how they always do this. Probably raise taxes some. They may cut some other forms of spending, especially social programs that we just talked about. Um, those could all hurt the economy. Prices might increase. I think in this context of a single pair, they'd probably decrease. But there's kind of this argument that the more market competition you have, you lower the price. Doctors may try to charge more. Now they may fail because they're negotiating with the government. But there are some arguments as to why prices would increase. Um, it would wipe out the insurance industry. Obviously, people have a lot of jobs in the insurance industry. Healthcare administration jobs would all go away. As I said, that generates a savings, but also causes massive unemployment. Wages would probably go down in healthcare if reimbursement rates went down. Um, so there's a lot of ways that even like the cost saving measures that the affirmative is talking about adopting would hurt the economy. And of course, now currently, right, we're all kind of managing inflation, right? You can see inflation's increased a lot in the economy. It has started to stabilize. There's a debate about whether it'll continue to be stable or whether it will increase. Um, but the reality is if, you know, the, the government starts injecting hundreds of billions of dollars into the economy through increased healthcare services, it's probably caused a stimulatory a fact, there would probably be a greater stimulus um, that may cause the Fed or the Federal Reserve to raise rates even faster than they were planning, which could hurt the economy in addition to the effects of just kind of inflation uh, hurting the poor. So if you like to kind of have like updated arguments is obviously with the uniqueness and the brink and like how the Fed would react and like, you know, how many points of an increase or, you know, percentage of a points of an increase would hurt the economy. If you're good with arguments like that, then that's an argument for you. Now, disadvantages, we already talked about a couple, but I'll just uh, add, a, you know, a little bit more there and add a couple more. You know, in terms of spending, most people say this would cost around three to four trillion dollars a year. Our entire federal additional, our entire federal budget is only around six trillion. Um, now, of course, costs might decline in some areas. Like I say, the government currently pays for some health care that could become cheaper, Um you know, there would be like some tax collection that would increase as a part of this, uh, you know, types of things like that. So, you know, you probably wouldn't spend out that uh, without revenue, that entire three to four trillion dollars. But it gives you a sense of the significance and it gives you kind of a way of managing the argument that, you know, people are going to make, hey, the government spends money all the time, that the deficit's always increasing and 
or decreasing. If it's decreasing, it's more due to like economic growth in general, like tax revenues. You know, most plans, most policies that debaters discuss, honestly, aren't really going to push the needle on the total debt one way or the other. But this is an example of something that really could push it one way or the other. And that's why I want to uh, stress that cost. Inflation, we just talked about. The political capital argument argues that if the president is more of a policy argument, but becoming popular in LD, especially on the national circuit, if the president would have to push for passage of something like this, then he would have to spend his political capital. Um, and political capital is just kind of his influence and his pop combined with like his popularity and the overall support he has. And some people say now that that's starting to rebound, right? We're a year after out of Afghanistan. When uh, he Biden withdrew the remaining forces from Afghanistan, there were obviously a lot of problems um, that resulted. A lot of people died. That really kind of hurt his popularity, his credibility. Then we had more COVID in the year than people thought we were going to have, and it continued to decline. But now as we see the recent passage of some legislation, and that's increased. Now he has a little more political capital and popularity. Um, now the problem is, that tactically, a lot of the agenda items that he's been pushing have already kind of been pushed through. But if you can find another agenda item that the president is trying to push, maybe some antitrust regulation for big tech, you could argue that he needs the political capital he has now to get that passed. And if you pass universal health care, his political capital will be lost, undermining his ability to get that other agenda item passed. There's an essay on the argument in the, on the Debate Us website if you're not familiar with it. There's the midterms argument. Look, midterms are coming up. Uh, most uh, Democrats are likely actually now they say around 62 percent chance to maintain control of the uh, maintain control of the Senate. Um, if this and if this was like unpopular, you could say, well, now they won't retain control of the Senate. Republicans are probably going to get control of the House. So then they would have control of the House and the Senate. Uh, what they could do as long as Biden's president is probably not a lot because they're not going to have a a veto proof majority. But if we get another uh, Republican president, then you could argue that's bad. Um, you could argue it's popular. Um, you could try to say that this would allow the Democrats to retain control of the House. Um, then you could have obviously some kind of bigger impacts there, especially uh, if the Republicans are able to get control of the House and the Senate. But that's coming up and midterm arguments are always pop popular. Uh, there's a federalism. Federalism deals with the balance of power between the states and the federal government. Some people say that it's really the job of the states to deal with health care, not the job of the federal uh, federal government. So there's some link evidence and a little bit of impact evidence for that included. We'll probably be adding some more. Immigration. The argument is that free health care could encourage immigration, um, which, uh, you know, more immigration than we have. Immigration growth. Uh, people argue that if it grows too fast, it could hurt the economy, uh, undermine social services. There's a big debate about that. Um, or you can kind of go the other way and argue if we had national health insurance, there'd be more surveillance of populations and more undocumented or illegal aliens uh, would be removed. And you can argue that's bad. There's a, a disadvantage. This is health. Uh, tourism is bad. If costs were to rise in the United States, if there were to be longer wait times or more rationing, people might seek health care abroad, which could be bad for their health. So those are some kind of broader uh, disadvantages. In terms of counter plans, if counter plans are popular on your allowed on your on your uh, LD circuit, there are many counter plans. Um, first, as I suggested at the beginning, you could say that the state should do this instead of the federal government. As long as you win, the United States refers to the federal government. You could obviously read disadvantages about why expanding the federal debt is bad. You could have the common net benefit of politics, and we just talked about federalism. Why? This should really be left to the states. The public option counter plan says rather than have a single payer, basically allow anybody, basically take Medicare and have that as an optional insurance for like anybody. A little bit like Obamacare, but it's more that just anybody could kind of buy into this full on and that the, uh, the government kind of would become a, a competitor um, in the provision of health insurance, right? Even now, Obamacare, you're really buying into another health care plan, um, this would just make the government the government a payer, right? The government would become a payer instead of a single payer, right? And it would compete against like all the health insurance plans. And some people argue that that, remember, I talked about market competition, would best protect market competition and put pressure on these insurance companies to keep prices 
down. You could expand the Affordable Care Act, right? You could provide a greater subsidy for people to purchase into the existing system. You could provide more financing support for it. You could argue that wouldn't be as cost as Biden as much political capital. It wouldn't destroy the private insurance companies. In fact, it would protect them. It might protect the pharmaceutical industry if there wasn't as much negotiation of pharma pharma prices. You could expand the individual tax credit, which is kind of like an all payer system. I've seen this. Somebody wrote a book with, a, you know, we, everybody should be their own payer. Right. So you could give people greater like tax credits, um, which really offset the amount of taxes that people owe. Poor people don't really owe any taxes, but they could get what's called a refundable credit where they actually get money back. Right. So it's like if you don't owe any taxes, but you still have a tax credit coming, you could claim that as cash. You could arguably try to, depending on how teams define universal service, say, oh, well, we don't want to provide certain services. Like you could say we don't want to provide services for abortion. And you could argue that abortion is bad. We don't want to provide services for mental health care. And you could like critique the idea of mental health care. Um, some people say smokers like shouldn't be allowed to have um, health insurance because it might encourage them to smoke. And if we didn't allow them to have it, then they would stop smoking. That's pretty controversial, as you can imagine. But no more just examples. A health savings account allows people to put more money away, like tax free, right? It's similar to a uh, you know a uh, retirement plan or a, a college savings plan. Although with those, you eventually have to pay taxes on the money you make, but it just grows tax free. But this you know this could you could allow your money to grow tax free. Or just just be tax free forever. Whatever you get out of it, even when you withdraw it, you don't have to pay the taxes, and you could use that for medical care. You could allow more like cross state purchasing of health care to make that easier, um, or you could just implement the uh, pharma price caps. I said at the bottom here that a good one AC will try to talk about why a single payer is better than all of these. Now, look, it's kind of hard to uh, two things. One, if counter plans are not relevant in your circuit then you don't need to worry about this, right? You don't need to say that single payer is better than all these things because the other team can't even propose them, okay? The second thing I'll say is that, you know, you given how many there are, you really want to kind of like focus on talking about why, you, why what you're arguing is better than like what your opponent is likely to argue. So for example, right, if your opponent usually runs a single payer counter plan, then kind of stuff your 1AC with cards that single payer is better than public option. Or, the, you know, if they run the state's counter plan, then against the states. You never know. They could obviously switch up the counter plan, but it's more useful to have cards against what they are likely going to run. Uh, in terms of critiques, I already mentioned the libertarianism critique uh, many times, so I won't discuss it again. The capitalism critique obviously is a bit opposite of the libertarianism critique, but it's it's your basic argument that like, hey, we really need to kind of get rid of capitalism entirely. And that if we don't get rid of capitalism entirely, uh, then we'll still have inequality, racism, war, environmental destruction, etc. And having a single payer just, uh, you know, makes it makes it kind of pretend that everything's OK. It's just a reform. We need a radical resolution. A revolution. Afro-pessimism, again, just says like, you know, imagine like, Trying to solve racism through like civil society or these types of approaches is ultimately uh, disadvantageous to black Americans and that it's bad. Uh, there's a uh, data surveillance argument that says that the uh, if you if you uh, have a national health insurance system, then the government is going to collect like all this medical information. Right. And you're paying for these services. They're going to have all this medical information about everybody. Um, they take up all the insurance information the insurance companies have, and they're going to have it directly. Um, in fact, it's the way that teams claim to, if they claim like a, a bioterrorism advantage or a disease argument, right? They're talking about surveillance. The argument is, is that like we kind of really don't want the government to have all this information about our own health. Um, uh, as you can imagine, there are problems with that. The non-citizen argument says that like when if you have a single payer that doesn't include non-citizens, um, then that's really kind of racist and wrong and uh, should be rejected. So those are examples of critiques. I mean, whatever critique, if, you, if you're a critique debater and you, you know, nowadays there's a lot of people arguing the capitalism critique or Afro-pessimism critique. A little libertarian, obviously, uh, a lot less common, though, on some topics it's very common, especially in LD. Um, they're very strong links to those arguments. Now, finally... I just kind of uh, put at the end here, these are some resources that we have that are available to our subscribers. 
We have a free uh, daily update. Um, I actually have a 520 page master file uh, that includes most, though not all, of our arguments. And, and now that that's actually been updated to around 750 pages, we have the pharma DA that I've talked about. We have our morality master core file with the utilitarianism deontology debate. We have disease impacts and impact defense, bioterrorism and impact defense definitions of the United States. Those are all included with our um, with our subscriptions.